Hi, I'm Tim. Please join me in this video as we discuss whether or not the FAA will eliminate at some point FRIAs or FAA recognized identification areas as part of the rollout of the remote ID program. Let's get to it. So the subject of this video is will the FAA at some point eliminate free as the FAA recognized identification areas? I'll go into more detail here shortly. A FRIA is a carve-out of the remote ID ruling whereby RC modelers, fixed-wing helicopters or drones, they can fly without any of the electronic equipment needed to identify remote ID and RC model airplane. They're typically going to be at AMA flying sites or some um, community-based organization like a, a school or a college. Again, with FRIAs, the huge advantage of FRIAs, you do not need any equipment to comply with this remote ID ruling. So the executive summary real quick is, in my opinion, the FAA has a long-term commitment to the FRIAs. I do not see them going away ever. I see them probably expanding in usage. Just my opinion, nobody's really good at predicting the future with 100% certainty, but I think it's a pretty safe bet that FRIAs are here to stay, and I'll expand upon that a little bit throughout the video. Before we go, I'd like to thank you for any likes, subscribes, or Facebook uh, recommendations you could add to this visit, uh, video. They help the al algorithm tremendously. If you'd like to kind of see where we are, just hover over the timeline below. The video is divided up into chapters. Remote ID is a hot topic of the day. Remote ID is a program by the FAA to have identifying features on model aircraft. We're talking about models that weigh um, 250 grams or over, 8.0 ounces or over, uh, need to have some sort of um, electronics on board to identify them, take off location, altitude, certain flight parameters with the exception of the FRIA. The remote ID is part of the overall FAA vision that really kicked off in about 2012 of figuring out how to have fully integrated manned and unmanned operations in the national airspace system. Because unmanned aircraft cannot see and avoid, which is a central part of safety for FAA combined operations, visual and controlled aircraft, the only way to successfully integrate unmanned and manned aircraft flying in the national airspace system is through technology. And a lot of that technology doesn't exist. Because we're unmanned aircraft, this technology will advance rapidly. We've seen a series of implementation, step, implementation steps. The first time we had to register our um, model aircraft to the FAA about 2015, uh, Part 107 regulations for commercial flyers, uh, testing for recreational flyers with a trust test. And the next big step on this is remote ID. Uh, the remote ID discussion started back in, um, really in 2018 with the FAA Reauthorization Act. It gave an impetus funding congressional direction to the FAA and the remote ID was to do something to figure out where these millions of um, unmanned aircraft, recreational, commercial are flying in the national airspace system. So as part of remote ID, the FAA did a notice of proposed rulemaking. There was a bunch of requirements uh, to include things like a network to remote ID system that went away in the final ruling. Part of that initial ruling was the concept of an FAA recognized identification area, a small airspace, typically over a local club or ed educational institute flying site, where modelers had been there historically, they tended to have a runway or some club location, they did not stray too far <coughs> from that site, and if you could define a FRIA in terms of altitude and airspace limitations, the FAA agreed that this would be a good part or, um, of the overall remote ID plan to let modelers fly in the FRIA airspace without any equipment at all. The important thing to understand is when the uh, draft rule came out from the FAA, the FRIAs were envisioned to last just one year. The transition after a year, by that time, everybody could purchase a remote ID module, everybody would have the modules in their aircraft, and there was no need for a FRIA. <clears throat> in the back and forth with the user groups, pri primarily the Academy of Model Aeronautics, the concept of a FRIA was expanded to 48 months or four years, so FRIAs are being issued now are good for four years. Super important to note when remote ID comes into effect. This is being filmed the last week of August 2023. FRIAs, everything with remote ID are in the future. They come into effect about um, two and a half weeks from now on September 16th, 2023. At, 
On September 16th, 2023, FRIAs will become effective if they're approved. All other aircraft need remote ID electronics, either standard installed in the factory or a module that you can purchase and put in the aircraft to be compliant with a remote ID ruling. Because of delays with FRIA approval, the end of August is probably about 700 FRIAs approved by the FAA. There's at least 2,500 AMA clubs. The AMA has probably submitted at least 1,500 applications. The FAA is late for reasons I'll talk about a little bit. It is possible the September 16th date could be slipped. We won't know that probably until September 15th or so. But right now, our free has come into effect on September 15th, 2023. I think it's safe to say that there's frustration in a lot of places with the entire FRIA approval process. The way it works in the FAA, FAA authorizing legislation, there has to be a community-based organization that submits a FRIA request to the FAA. It cannot be individuals. Uh, the AMA was the first community-based organization. I believe the FAA right now lists four of those on their site. So what happens, the AMA has a procedure worked out with the FAA how to submit the applications. There is not a complete listing of approved FRIAs at this time. Uh, the reason for that, I would guess, is the FAA is very busy analyzing and approving the FRIAs as they come in. Some FRIA requests are being denied. Uh, they might be in controlled airspace. They might be at an airport where the FAA might not have been aware there was model airplane activity at that airport. Will those be resolved in the future? I, I don't know. It's worth a conversation. But, there are, but the FAA, I think, is completely focused on approving FRIAs. After September 16th, we'll probably be able to see FRIAs on the um, FAA map for that. And that is the UAS data delivery system. Now, this is going to be a very comprehensive interactive map of the United States. And will show um, AR, uh, air control traffic boundaries, class uh, control uh, airspace, B, C, D, and so forth. It'll all be in various layers on this map. We'll take a look here at a video of that map. And you'll see um, fixed sites for um, unmanned aircraft uh, flying. What the fixed sites are, they are agreements to fly in or near controlled airspace. So the FAA is aware of these flying locations. The one I'll show you is by Columbus Airport. And um, you'll see that there is a fixed site in the Class C airspace. So it's right on the boundary of the Class C airspace. You'll see as we click on it, the upper altitude is 200 feet. Above ground level is for a junior ROTC educational detachment. So those are on there. I believe when FRIAs come into existence on September 16th, we'll be able to see FRIAs on this data delivery system, just not right now, prior to September 16th. So let's take a quick look at that map. I'll show you what the fixed site looks like and what will eventually uh, show up as the various FRIAs. This is a UAS data delivery system. It's Columbus, and you can see Columbus International Airport. It's a uh, shared guard reserve base. And there is a fixed site. We're going to zoom in on it. We'll click on it. It's a junior ROTC. When you click on the middle, it gives details on it. Note that the ceiling is 200 feet above ground level with the boundaries listed as such. It's in the Class C airspace. We'll go over to the layer list here on the right. And what we'll do is we'll deselect Class C, see how that goes away. So this map will show a variety of airspaces, the fixed sites and control airspaces, free as at some point. As I mentioned earlier, FRIAs were initially set up for just one year. It was a transition to when all modelers were presumed to have remote ID modules um, in their aircraft. In the course of the negotiations with the um, comments that, that models provided on the notice of proposed rulemaking, that one year and then done period was transitioned to four years. We'll have to see what happens at the end of four years if they're renewed. I see no reason why they won't be renewed. I'd like to talk a little bit of why FRIAs tend to make a lot of sense, at least to me. So just remember the rules of the FRIAs, the FAA recognized identification area, they're for recreational flyers only. If you're flying under part 107, you'll need to have remote ID electronics in your model, either installed in the factory or a module. So recreational flyers only, and they are associated with community-based organization. The vast majority for viewers of this channel will be the Academy of Model Aeronautics. There's probably about 2,500 total flying sites most, if not all, will likely apply for FRIA status. We'll see how many actually get approved. One of the big attractions of the FRIA, from the FAA's viewpoint at least, is, is they're free. They don't cost anything. And they are a service to recreational modelers who fly at a club field. You just, once the FRIA is established, 
nothing's changed for you. Just show up and fly your model. You don't need any remote ID hardware at all to be compliant with remote ID. Recall that FREAs will be in uncontrolled airspace, so the FAA does not worry too much about uncontrolled airspace. It exists, but they, the FAA really doesn't have much to do with it in terms of controlling aircraft. Full-scale um, operators of aircraft know where they're in, when they are flying in uncontrolled air, airspace. It is a see and avoid um, situation, and that's just the agreement of how we do uh, fly aircraft in, in, in uncontrolled airspace. Also, from the FAA's viewpoint, FRIAs are essentially a miniature restricted airspace. It's just a defined area where model aircraft will be flying. So the FAA knows that. Again, they don't care too much because this is an uncontrolled airspace. They aren't responsible for vectoring traffic in there. But it is important to understand the FAA is extremely comfortable and understands restricted airspace. There is a ton of restricted airspace in the United States. Some of that restricted airspace, when you go out west in the Nellis, our ranges in Nevada, the restricted airspace can be well over 30,000 feet. Um, the FAA is flying airline and traffic over that restricted airspace. They understand where it is, how to handle it. So the FRIAs are not something new and substantially different from what the FAA has reasonably been dealing with in the past. One of the reasons that I would offer that FRIAs are here to stay as part of the remote ID program is just the sheer amount of work that the FAA did to get the FRIAs uh, approved and established. One of the frustrating things about the FRIA rollout was how late it happened, how close it jammed up against the September 16th date of remote ID. I don't think the FAA fully realized how much work was going to be done on this whole FRIA process. And one of the things I'm going to talk about and, and show you um, that existed was it turns out that the, um, the FAA had to do an environmental impact assessment, an environmental impact assessment. It's a 1969 environmental law that anytime the federal government puts in a new program like a FRIA, they have to do an assessment to see if that will impact the environment. And if it impacts it too much, the program might be denied. Believe it or not, the FRIA process, that had to be done by the FAA. The report is 110 pages long. It's really quite interesting. It goes into a whole bunch of stuff so the people reading the report from the environmental agency will look and understand what remote ID is, the standard module free of concepts, what a flying club is, what the educational inst um, institutions are that will benefit from it. We'll look at a video here that goes over it. The final summation of the video is if the FRIAs are denied, the modelers are still going to fly there anyhow with their remote ID modules. So there is minimal environmental impact from the modelers. They recommended it be um, approved. So that whole thing had to be done. There had to be a 30-day comment period on it. That finalized the second week of July 2023. So the FRIAs could not even be addressed by the FAA until that was done. So the FAA has been working since the second week of July, approving the FRIAs, uh, and, and this is where we are right now. We're coming up pretty close, as I mentioned, to the September 16th date when they have to be in place. Um, we'll have to wait and see what happens. Everything's a little bit late, with the exception of the drone manufacturers. The drone manufacturers with standard ID, they had to be compliant with delivered drones December 22nd, 2018, excuse me, 20, December 18th, 2022. The drone manufacturers have complied with that. They're in good shape for drones that you buy um, at the store. The remote ID module is still uh, kind of going in fits and starts. Probably the easiest plug and play module is the Spectrum uh, Sky ID. It just got released for sale on August 25th of 2023. That will, should be shipped by September 16th. There's gonna be, the vast majority of models will not have that in time. Will the September 16th date be slipped? I think it may, we'll have to wait until very close to that date. So that being said, let's take a look at that program, at the um, environmental impact assessment, just to show the amount of work, uh, sheer man hours that went into the FAA's background work to allow FRIAs to come into existence. This is the 110 page programmed assessment environmental for the FRIAs. You can see a ton of work went into it. It's talking about FRIAs, the notice of rules, rulemaking, all part of the remote ID system. This is required before FRIAs can be issued by the FAA. The contents is just amazing how much they have to cover for this, all part of a 1969 environmental law. They give an introduction, the overview, 
They reference that 1969 National Environmental Policy Act, why they have to do it. Remember, the people reading this may have no idea what an RC model airplane is, let alone remote ID or FRIA. The purpose is to lay all this out. They define the three types of remote ID, standard, module, and FRIA, how they affect, what people are going to do with them. They walk through what a model airfield looks like so you can have an idea of what we're talking about, the educational part of it here with junior uh, ROTC students learning about drone aircraft. As it continues on, it says well, what's going to happen if we do nothing. The answer is people are going to fly their models anyhow, the remote ID modules. This is a location of every AMA club in the United States. They wanted to tell where the freers are likely going to be, and then even the educational institutions. They talk about the uh, endangered species. You can see corals, insects, mammals, reptiles, the amount of detail you go into. And this is the final end. This is the number of people with years of experience working on this report. Thank you for joining me in this video. Uh, the theme of this whole thing is I believe FRIAs are here to stay. They're initially issued for four years. They're a common sense solution. They don't really impact man traffic uh, much at all. It's awareness of where you can fly without the remote ID hardware. The FRIA concept is, um, makes a lot of sense for fixed wing and helicopter RC pilots. The drone pilots that like to explore, take pictures in all uh, various locations, it's kind of the nature of drone flying, are going to be relatively unhappy with the FRIA concept. But this whole remote ID thing is just being rolled out in stages. I think you will see a growth of FRIAs. I think they will be authorized for um, designated events like uh, AMA contests and things like that. I think you will see uh, exceptions from time to time, raising the 400 foot above ground level altitude of all FRIAs approved to date. So the whole remote ID is an initial step in fully um, integrated manned, unmanned operations in the national airspace system. There's gonna be rapid changes in how the remote ID is implemented. And I think the FRIAs will be a part of that as a good long-term solution for the recreational RC airplane pilot. Thank you.